<laughs> Scripture today uh, comes from Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 30. Hear now, for this is the word of God. And behold, a man came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, All these I have kept. What do I still lack? Jesus said to him, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. And Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I say to you, only with difficulty will a rich person enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. When the disciples heard this, they were greatly astonished, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus looked at them and said, With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and followed you. What then will we have? Jesus said to him, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses, or brothers, or sisters, or father, or mother, or children, or lands, for my name's sake, will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last first. This is the word of God. All right. In the past few decades, um, the evangelical churches have somewhat oversimplified what it means to be a Christian. And from a large scale of crusade to a small church setting, what many people heard that all you have to do to be a Christian, to be saved, is accept Jesus into your heart and repeat this prayer after me. That's it. Accept Jesus into your heart and repeat this prayer after me. You are saved. You are a Christian. Really? Well, what does that mean that you accept Jesus into your heart? The heart. What does that mean? Like, it means thinking good about Jesus? Positive? Feeling good about Jesus? What does that mean, accepting Jesus into your heart? And once you pray the prayer one time in your life, and now you are good, now you are a Christian? What does it mean to be a Christian? How? Wait. Is there really a main way how the Bible describes about the conversion? How one becomes a Christian? How one can be saved? What is the meaning of believing in Jesus in the Bible? What's the meaning of believing? What does that mean? What's interesting to me is that Jesus never said to anybody, never said to anybody whom he encountered, says, Accept me into your heart and let's pray together. Jesus never said to anybody, accept me into your heart and repeat after me. Pray with me. Okay, you're good. Then what did he say? What did he say? Here in this story, a young man came to Jesus and asked about eternal life. How can I be saved? And he said, teacher, what good deeds must I do to have eternal life? Well, those of us who are well trained in the Bible, who understand the gospel, our first response would be 
something like this. Friend, you cannot earn salvation, eternal life by good deeds. You cannot earn it by doing good works. Salvation is not based on works. It is you repenting your sin and believing in Jesus Christ in His grace. So and so and so. Somehow along, along the line of this, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone, not by works, we saved. It's not about good things. Friend, wrong approach in your question. What good deeds must I do to be saved? No. Well, is that what Jesus said to this man? Look at verse 17. That's not what he said. He said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There is only one who is good. If you would enter life, keep the commandments. What? Keeping the commandments? If you want to enter eternal life, keep the commandments, it sounds like salvation is based on works. You're keeping the commandments. Is Jesus preaching a different gospel than what Paul preached to us or any other apostles preached to us? He sounds like we can be saved by, based on works, keeping the commandments. Verse 18. He said to him, which ones? And Jesus said, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witnesses, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, indeed, what Jesus said here is true. We will enter the kingdom of heaven. We will have eternal life if we keep the commandments, hear me, perfectly. If we have, if we can keep the commandment flawlessly to perfection. But can we keep the commandments of God perfectly, flawlessly? The scripture tells us that if you break any one of it, you break the whole law, entire law, and you are guilty of the all law, you are a lawbreaker. We cannot enter the kingdom of God and have eternal life based on our words because we cannot keep the commandments perfectly. The reason we say we cannot be saved by words is because we cannot do it. The perfection in the keeping the commandment is in view here in order to have eternal life. Look at verse 21. That's what Jesus says. If you be perfect, you got to be perfect in order to have eternal life, in order to enter the kingdom. But who is perfect keeping the commandments? Notice there that Jesus did not even mention the entire Ten Commandments. He just mentioned the second half of the Ten Commandments. The commandments related to other people in relationship. Don't murder, no steal, no lie, so and so, honor your father and mother. Only the second half. Well, one can say, you shall not murder. I kept the commandment. I didn't kill anybody. You shall not steal. Maybe other person can say, oh, I, I didn't break their commandments. I didn't steal anything from anybody. They may say that I kept the commandment based on their interpretation, based on their standards. But anybody can say with the last one that he mentioned here, he gave the summary of those second half of the Ten commandment. It says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Who among us can say, I never failed the one in my life. I loved my neighbor as myself. Perfectly, flawlessly, I kept it all. Who can say that? Well, again, Jesus did not even go to the first half of the Ten Commandments. If, I, if we summarize the first half of the Ten Commandments, Jesus would say, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and might. Who can say, 
I love God with all my soul and strength and mind, with everything, top, yes. Then the expected response from this young man would be something like, I'm guilty. I failed many times in life. <laughs> How can I be forgiven, Jesus? That would be the expected response from this young man. But that is not what this young man said. Well, this story has many surprise elements, shocking elements here. Look at what he said, verse 20. The young man said to him, All this I have kept. What do I still lack? Well, actually, if you read the same story in the Gospel of Luke, this young man said, I have kept them all since I was little. Throughout my life, all my life, I kept it. Didn't break any. I'm good. Here's a young man with moral excellency. Here's a man who most people regard as high character. Man of integrity, man of honesty, pure heart. With high moral standard, he strived to be a good moral person. He is very loving and charming man, always kind and gentle to others. He has a great reputation among other people. And probably he's the ideal person whom most of the ministry leaders want to have. Not only that, he was very he is very successful, rich man. Look at verse 22. That's what verse 22 says about this man. He was rich. So he has all those three components that many our single young woman wants to see from a single man. Young, that's what he said, young man, rich, and high moral excellency. In other words, he's a good guy. He's a good guy. Rich, young, good guy. I don't know if he was good looking or not. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say about that one. Man, if he was good looking, maybe he is, would be like the main character in the Korean drama you know, you know, rich, good-looking, nice, always kind and gentle, rich, you know, but with reality right there. Everybody say, I speak highly of him. He had many things what people in this world want to have in this life. Yet he was asking, what do I lack? What am I missing? I'm missing something here. For whatever reason, he wasn't confident about his salvation. So he was asking, what am I missing? I'm missing something. I know I'm missing something. Now, the no now notice that Jesus did not even say to the man, it's like, when he says, I've kept them all. Like, you liar. He didn't do that. He didn't do that. Anybody who's angry with his brother have already committed murder. Any man who seen another woman with lustful intent already committed adultery. You just lied to me. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus does not even go to that direction. He does not even try to argue with this young man how he broke the law of God. He didn't. And what did he say? Rather, his approach was simply pointing out this young man's very need. What you need. What you lack. Verse 21. Jesus said to him, If you be perfect, go, sell what you possess, and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Same version, same story in different version in the gospel. Luke 18, 22 says this. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. In other words, one thing you still lack to be perfect. You want to be perfect? One thing you are missing. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. You need to be perfect in order to enter the kingdom of heaven. And to be perfect, there's only one thing you are lacking here. Not thousand things, not hundred things, but just one thing. And that one thing will complete you and make you perfect. And that one thing is to worth to sell all your great possession, your wealth, and give it to the poor. It is worth in order to have that one thing. What is the one thing that he needs to have? Jesus says, Come, follow me. Come, have me. Have me. One thing you lack, come, have me. Let me be your greatest, highest treasure. Jesus is the one thing that completes you. Jesus is the one thing that sinner can be perfect before God. Even if you fall short in all aspects of morality, like the prostitute, like the tax collector, oh, sinners, or even if, on the other side, you are very highly moral, religious people, doing all things, like Pharisees, both the sinners or Pharisees, come short. They are not perfect to have the eternal life. They are not perfect to enter the kingdom of God. You lack. Whether you are like this or that, you lack. If you just have this one thing, Jesus, He makes you perfect before God. He takes all your sins away. And he imputes all his righteousness into you. That you can be counted as righteous before God. Not based on your work, on him. If you have him and you belong to him, on account of Jesus Christ, God is pleased with you. God justifies you. God forgives you. God cleans you. God accepts you. God adopts you as his child. God sanctifies you. He preserves you till the end. He will give you eternal life. He will raise you up. He will glorify you on based on this Jesus Christ. He is the one thing that you need. To be perfect. Did you catch that hint previously in verse 17? Because when the young man asked, What good deed, work, must I do? And Jesus' answer was, Why are you asking me about what is good? What about what good thing, good deed, good work? There is only one who is good. Young man, this is not about good thing or good deed. This is about a person who is good. This is about a person who is good. Not something you need to add to yourself. To be perfect, you need to have it. Come and have me. I am your justification. I am your righteousness. I am your salvation. Jesus is. So Jesus is saying, in all the money you are holding in your hands, just your money is just full of, your hands are just full of money. Let it go. And it will fall to the poor. I said this before. Let it go. And then your hands are, will be empty. With their empty hands, come, hold my hand. Let's walk. It was not just one time, accept me into your heart and just repeat this prayer with me. No. From now on, let your life be with me. Hold my hand. Let's walk together. You come follow me. I'm better than all your great wealth. The ultimate prize of believing Jesus and following Jesus is having this Jesus and being with this Jesus 
from now to eternity. It's far greater than anything you can have in this world. Now look at verse 27. The Peter, then Peter said in reply, See, we have left everything and follow you. We did, Jesus. What then will we have? Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, in the new world, when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, do you see that glorious reality of Jesus, his worth? Jesus says, You who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone, that's not only for the apostles, he's talking about everyone, you and me, who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit the eternal life. Will inherit eternal life. Will inherit eternal life. You want to have eternal life? Come. Have me and follow me. You will inherit eternal life. See the worth of Jesus. Being a Christian, my brother, sisters, hear, hear me. Being a Christian is costly. Being a Christian means living a life reflecting the worth of your King, Jesus. Being a Christian means you being willing to forsake it all to have this Jesus. Do you see how costly it was for this young man? This was far more costly than accept Jesus, young man, into your heart and pray this prayer with me. Oh, how often Jesus said to all those people he met, he said, come follow me, come follow me, come follow me. Jesus demands much more than you would expect. He demands much more than you would expect. Do not minimize his message. He demands your relationship, your job, your money, your language, your world choices, your lifestyle, your everyday choices, your marriage, your parenting. He demands everything. Give it to me. Jesus is saying, Give it to me. Surrender your right to me. Let me decide how much money you will have. Let me decide what kind of house you will live. Let me decide what kind of job you will have. Let me decide your lifestyle. Let me decide your relationship, your family, your marriage, your work choices, your everyday life choices. Let me surrender your right to me. And submit and trust. He demands a lot more than you expect. He demands every area, every part of your life. Give it to me. But I want, I want, I need to be like this. Like, no, let me decide. Let me be the Lord of your life. Surrender your life. Trust me. Trust me. He demands much more than we expect. At the same time, he offers much more than you can imagine. When we see his worth and his trustworthiness, then Christ becomes the meaning of life, the purpose of life, and everything in life evolves surrounding, working, moving around this center, Jesus Christ. All is for Christ. Now, when Jesus said, it is easier for a camel to go going through the eye of the needle than a rich man entering into the kingdom of God. The people were shocked. They were greatly disturbed. Why? I've said this many times before because you got to understand their worldview because they saw prosperity and wealth as God's blessing 
for their goodness, for their obedience to God. It is called retribution theology, meaning if they are rich, healthy, prosper, it is because God has blessed them for their good deeds. They have done something good, right, so God has blessed them with richness, health, and prosperity. If something horrible happened to a person, they thought he must have done something horrible. Horrible sin, wrong before. Like, remember the, like, the story of Job. Something bad happened to Job and all the friends came. You have must have done some terrible sin. Repent, something like that. So if one is blind, one is sick, diseased, or is very poor, they thought God is punishing that person for his sin. So to the eyes of the people, having a great wealth and rich like this young man, it was like a sign of God's approval and favor. So, if anyone is close to the kingdom of God, they will say, there will be that young man. Young, rich, powerful, famous, that young man. But Jesus just smashed their expectation. And Jesus shows how completely and totally this young man was outside of God's kingdom. He says, a camel going through the eye of needle is easier for a rich man to enter God's kingdom. That's shocking. So they are asking, Oh, the wait, 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 wait. Those people who have God's blessing and approval and favor cannot enter God's kingdom. Then who can be saved? Forget about poor people like us. Forget about other people. See, it's like, who can be saved? Wait. Church, are you with me? Jesus here says, camel going through eye of needle and the rich man entered the kingdom, the kingdom of God. Rich man. Why did he specifically say rich man? Why? He's not saying a sinner entered the kingdom of heaven. He could have said generally sinner. Why he specifically targeting or mentioning a rich person? What's wrong with being rich? Have you ever thought about that? Why Jesus specifically mentioning rich person going to the kingdom of heaven? He could have said just sinners. This young man's problem was not lack of high morality, not his having a messed up life recklessly, not religious life. He had it all. <coughs> high morality, religious person. The young man's real issue was not missing a good deed. This young man's real issue and problem was the idol. And that was what Jesus exposed here. Money was the monster that was killing him. Clearly, he loved and trusted his wealth more than Jesus. Money was more important than entering to the kingdom of God. Money was more important than God. Money was more important than Jesus. So he went away from the presence of Jesus, the Messiah, Craving. It is still true with many people. Still many people walk away from Jesus. For some, are you listening? Having a lot of money can destroy their soul. But for others, not having enough money, always having short of money, can also ruin their soul. With envy and endless craving. I need more. Being a Christian is not having some addition of morality and or stop living a messed up life, straight up your moral life or some adding some Christian activity or religious life form or going to a church on Sunday or anything. What we need fundamentally it is not some addition of the high morality or good deed. It is not some correction of ourselves. What we need fundamentally is new life. You need to be a new person. You need to have a new heart. You need to be a new being. 
So Jesus says, it is impossible for man, but with God, all things possible. You being a new heart and new person, new creation, new being, it can only be done by God. It can only come from God. To be a Christian, to enter the kingdom of heaven, to have inner, to have to inherit the eternal life. It's not just you fixing something in your life. It's not just about you having a high moral life. I need to be a new person. That can only be done by God in Jesus Christ. He gives me new desire that I can forsake other things. Whether it's wealth or house or luxurious life or any other thing or craving and desire for the relationship or any other idols. Like this new heart now can love, trust, worship, desire Jesus. This new heart now is like value Jesus. This new eye that I can see the worth of Jesus now. I need this divine work being done to me. You see? Not good deeds you must do, but the one who is good is a relationship with the one whom God has sent Jesus. Let me end. I'm done. We have so many brokenness and shortcomings. All of us do. We have all the bad histories, pains, fears, anxious hearts. Christian life is not you trying to be perfect by doing things with a little bit of help of Jesus. It's not like, I need to be perfect. I need to be better. Jesus, help me here. Help me here. It's like Jesus is basically just some aid and I do this. And what do I need to do? It's not. It is about completely surrendering to Him and trusting Him. I'm broken. I'm coming short. I have many issues. I have issues, Jesus. I surrender my life, myself to You. And I trust You. You do it. You decide it. You lead. You make me new. You complete me. You make me perfect. I will hold on to you and my only hope is you. I'll just hold on to you. I cannot change. I cannot save. I hold on to you, Jesus. You are the one who makes me perfect before God. Let Jesus who is good, dictate your life. Let Jesus dictate your life. Let's pray.